Good morning, everyone. Don't mind, take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Leviticus. It's the uh, third book in your Bible if you're new to God's Word or if you're new to church. Um, very uh, profound book in the scriptures because a lot of folks aren't aware of this, but it's the most quoted book by our Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospels. So profound is this book that um, it really brings to light this theme that we're going to be discussing this morning about sanctification. Again, praise team, worship team, I want to thank you for the songs this morning because they really drive home what today's sermon is about, and that is sanctification. And really, biblically, what does that mean? What is it that God is communicating to us and revealing to us about this very profound truth? But more importantly, how does it apply in our lives? And how is it that one is sanctified? This morning, we're going to be looking at an incredible picture, an incredible type in the scriptures that really defines clearly what this truth is about. Because there are a lot of misconceptions. You know, there's a lot of notions out there and a lot of beliefs and religions out there that believe that once you come to Jesus, that first of all, all your problems go away, all your issues go away, that right now and the, the day that you came to him, that you are, you have arrived, that you have made it, that you have, uh, that you are, you are sinless in his eyes, mind you, but what you need to understand and what we're going to what God is going to reveal to us today is how it is that we transform our lives so that we can get to what we discussed a few months ago in Ephesians, where our condition and our circumstances in life don't dictate our position with Christ. That we understand and that we embrace that this life is a journey. And part of that journey includes who we are in Him as He sanctifies us and we'll define what exactly what that means. Am I still on here? Okay, good. I wasn't sure. Um, so that God could use us as he equips us, as he transforms us for his glory. So this morning, we're going to look at the uh, fifth compound name that we've been looking at over the last several weeks. And I shared with you that when uh, God is referring to himself, these, these titles, these attributes of himself, as he gives us these titles, he's meeting man at his need. And if there's ever a need that we have in this life in order for us to overcome, and it's simply this, that we become more like him, that we become Christ-like. That's what it means to be Christian, is to be Christ-like so that we can overcome, so that we understand and embrace the victorious life that he offers us. It's not to say that we're not going to deal with issues and challenges and, and problems and even sin in our lives. The issue and the charges we'll see this morning, how is it that God equips us so that we could genuinely become that vessel that Kalani was, was singing praises about so that we can be emptied out, so that we can be used. And this is really why we exist at the end of the day, folks. Don't forget this, so that we can be used for his glory. That our lives glorify him. And this morning we're going to see how it is that that happens in our lives. And so if you've got your Bibles, I want to share with you a couple of verses out of the book of Leviticus, which speaks of this very unique group of people known as the Levites. And it's out of the Levite tribe that the priests came out of. The priests were to be those that God called out to specifically minister God's word to the people. And I don't know if you realize this or know this, but in the New Testament, we are likened under these Levite priests that God has given each and every one of us a charge to minister him to those that God puts in our lives. If you remember from our vision statement that we shared with you, that we imparted to you back in January... One of our key thoughts and our key themes was that we make every member a minister. One of the big lies from religion is that you need to be part of some clergy system in order to become a minister in somebody's life. That is not the case. God has called each and every one of us to be that in somebody's life. He's called you for a purpose in, in using us and preparing us for that ultimate goal, that purpose where our lives glor glorify him we have to realize that we're these vessels 
that he has set apart, that he has sanctified for his use. And this morning, we'll look at exactly what that means. But before we turn there, I want to show you where this, this new name, this new title for him shows up. Yehovah, which means Lord M. Kadesh, which simply means the, my, Jehovah, my Lord, my sanctification. It's him that resources us, that gives us the power to be sanctified. And we'll explain and define what that word means in a minute. But the power and the glory comes from God. And he says this, and we find these words in the book of Leviticus to define this. Look with me in verse number 7 of chapter 20. Did I already tell you what chapter? Okay, chapter 20. And we're going to look at a couple verses. I love the book of Leviticus. A lot of people read Leviticus and sometimes and oftentimes get bored with it because you see all these intricate details. But those of you that have been involved with me on Wednesday night Bible study, take those principles that we've been imparting to you and sharing with you on Wednesday nights, apply them to these, to these letters that a lot of people, these books that a lot of people consider boring, and it's unbelievable what will pop out, what God will reveal to us about these powerful, incredible truths. And you find these words, you find that word sanctify or sanctification in our text this morning. Look with me in verse 7. And it says this, sanctify yourselves, therefore, this is God speaking through Moses and through the, to the Levites about their role, their responsibility. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy. You heard that word holy several times in some of the songs this morning. And this morning, we're going to see exactly how that happens in our lives. He goes on, he says this, for I am the Lord your God. And it says in verse 8, and ye shall keep my statutes and do them. There's an interesting charge. The key to becoming holy is a very simple but a very difficult thing for a lot of people's lives. And that is to be obedient to God's word. And he says this next in the text. He says this next in verse 8. He says, for I am the Lord which sanctify you. Which am kadesh you. He is the Lord, the God of sanctification. Why? Because he's holy. And for us to claim to be Christians or claim to be followers of Jesus, this is why you find over and over in the scriptures, be ye holy for I am holy, the word of God says. And the charge and the challenge for us this morning is to see what God's word says about how that happens in our lives. Because there are a lot of religions and denominations and beliefs out there that simply say that if you just do this or if you just do that, this is what makes you holy. This is how you become holy. And one of the most profound truths that we just saw in our text here this morning, here in verse 8, is this. Where God said, I am the Lord which sanctify you. It's He that provides to us. Jehovah Jireh, that gives us what we need to become holy. But what does it mean? Or what does the word sanctify mean? The word sanctify shows up for the first time in Scripture, in the Scriptures, in Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. It's in this verse, actually verses 1 through 3. It's in this, in this little passage in Genesis chapter 2 where the word sanctify and kadesh shows up for the first time in the word of God. This is what we, what we teach in Bible study as the principle of first mention. You have to find the occurrence of a certain word or a phrase in scripture and God will set a pattern. He'll, send, he'll set a consistent pattern through the rest of the word of God. And he says this in Genesis chapter 2 verses 1 through 3. He says, thus the heavens and the earth were finished. These are the very first words right after God does this incredible thing in chapter 1 about restructuring and recreating his creation, his universe. Why? To set forth his plan, which was going to include you, which was to include me. So he's setting the stage, he's setting the platform in place to redeem a fallen creation, to redeem a fallen planet, to redeem a fallen life. And it says this next, look with me in verse number, number one. It says, For the heavens, for thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made. 
And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And it says in verse 3, And God blessed the seventh day, and he emkadeshed it, and he sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. The first occurrence of the word sanctify. That word simply means this, folks. It means set apart. Here's another key thought, another key word that I want us to really embrace. And I think it's a word that we all really can communicate because when we hear the phrase set apart, we think, what does that really mean, set apart? Set apart for what? Here's a term or here's a definition that we could all grasp. It means to dedicate. Dedicate that day. Dedicate yourselves he says and the charge and the challenge and the issue for you and for me is how does that happen how does that play out in our lives he's given you everything that you need so that you could become that dedicated individual person that he's called to be for his glory Holiness doesn't come from me or from you or from each other. It comes from him. And he's given us all that we need in this life to become that vessel, if you will, that person, that individual. Because at the end of the day, don't lose sight of this, you were created for one thing and one thing only, and that is to bring glory to him. You were created by him and for him. Until, and until we grasp that, until we realize that, this life, I'm telling you up front, because some of us have been there, this life will never, ever make sense. You're created for him. And this morning, we're going to look at a, an individual that exemplifies how it is that we realize this whole thing about sanctification or dedication which God desires from each and every one of us. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me now to Genesis chapter number 5. Genesis chapter 5 is a very fascinating part of the Scriptures. It's fascinating because some crazy stuff playing out on planet Earth. Kind of like today a little bit. As a matter of fact, so profound is this period as it relates to the day and age in which we live that Jesus himself made reference to Genesis chapter 5. If you go back into the New Testament to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 24, which is known as the Olivet Discourse where he brought his disciples together one last time before he was to go to the cross One of the things that Jesus did with those 12 guys is he brings them together. He reveals to them them the conditions of the end times. He reveals to them the conditions of the planet of the world just before his return. And in verse 37, he says something really profound. You know what he says in verse 37 in Matthew 24? As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. In other words, he's saying to those disciples as they're asking about the last days or the end times, he says to them, if you really want to understand what it's going to be like just before I return, just before I come back, go back and study the days of Noah. Go back and consider what was going on in Genesis chapter 5 and 6, and those are some really crazy chapters. You get into chapter 6, man, and you see how crazy and bizarre and nutty the planet really was. And it says in the text in chapter 6 that it repented God. He was reconsidering why he even created man, is how evil and wicked things got. But in the midst of all that craziness, in the midst of all that nuttiness, there was an individual that lived within the, the bizarreness of the planet who stood out. You know what's really interesting about this guy? His name means dedicated. His name means sanctified. And principle number 12 of Bible study for you Wednesday night Bible students, you know the importance of types in the Bible. 
how these types and these pictures have been left in our word to reveal profound truths to us. Because what's interesting about this guy named Dedicated, or whose name means Dedicated, he shows up just before judgment comes. You know what's really interesting? God removes him from this planet just before the world and the earth is destroyed by the flood. Anybody know who this guy is? I heard all kinds of names. Elijah, not even close. You are close. It starts with an E. Enoch. Turn with me now to the book of Genesis chapter 5, verse number, I believe, 18. We're going to look at these very incredible, powerful verses in the life of this guy named Enoch because this guy exemplifies for you and for me what it means to be sanctified in the midst of a crazy, bizarre, sinful, sin-infested and sinful world. And it says this in verse number 18, And Jared lived 102 years, and he begat Enoch. This is the genealogy of Adam and Seth that you see playing out in this chapter. Go back and read and begin with verse number one sometime when you get some, a chance to get some context, some perspective, but you're seeing this genealogy play out. And listen to what is said about this guy because of all the names that show up in chapter 5, the Holy Spirit of God stops, calls a timeout, and he begins to detail some things about this guy. A lot of names mentioned in chapter 5, but it's this guy who God chooses to focus on because of what he typifies, because of the picture that he is in our lives. And it says this in verse number 19. And Jared lived after he begat Enoch 800 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Jared were 960 and two years and he died. Man, those people lived for a long time, huh? Praise God. We'll talk about some time about why that was the case. And Enoch, verse 21, and Enoch lived 60 and five years and he begat Methuselah. Methuselah, I think a lot of us are familiar with him, the oldest guy in the Bible, 969 years. I won't talk to you about what his name means, but it's profound, significant. So Methuselah's dad was this guy named Enoch, whose name means dedicated, whose name means sanctified. And Enoch, I love this, verse 22, and Enoch walked with God catch that in the midst of a bizarre and nutty and crazy world this guy chose to walk with God and Enoch walked with God and he begat Methuselah 300 years and he begat sons and daughters and all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years and Enoch and this verse is for the slow class, in case you didn't hear it the first time. <laughs> and Enoch walked with God, and he was not. Listen to this. For God took him. Poof. Gone. Out of here. This guy is a picture and an incredible and a powerful type of the believer as God continues to set the stage for his return, we're seeing like never before a crazy and nutty and bizarre world. And just before that judgment hits, that judgment comes as Jesus defines in Matthew 24 and verse 15 as the great tribulation, there's going to be a departure of those who God has called to be his followers, to be his sanctified ones to charge you and me to simply walk with him. You want to get through this crazy and nutty life? You better learn what it means to walk with God. That's the key to life. But This morning, we're going to see those keys. We're going to see how it is that God reveals to us through his word, through this, in, in this particular individual, what it means to genuinely live this dedicated, sanctified life 
for the honor of Jesus Christ, for his honor and his honor only. And here's what's interesting about this guy named Enoch. He shows up more often in the New Testament than in the Old. The only mention of him in the Old Testament is right here in Genesis chapter 5. Here's what's fascinating. He shows up three times in the New Testament. Are you getting the picture here? Are you getting to understand who this guy represents and who and what he's really about? Because in order for us to realize what God has called us to be, I'm not saying do, I'm talking about to be. We have to understand what it means to walk with him. And as we walk with him, as we understand and we embrace this journey with him, he will refine us like the song suggested. He will sanctify us. He will dedicate us. He will set us apart for his glory. And in those three occurrences that we're going to look at in the book of, not in the book of, but in the New Testament, you're going to see three stages to your walk. Three stages to this journey that God has ordained for those dedicated, sanctified people. And this guy pictures that in our lives because what we see and what I see in Christianity today, a lot of people that are falling way, way short of what it means to be like Enoch. Of what it means to be dedicated, committed, consecrated for, God, for God's glory. Because you'll never find the fulfillment and the purpose and all that God has called you to be and to realize until you realize, until we realize who we are in Him. And that's the first principle. This is the first stage in this walk. And the first principle in this walk is this understanding of walking or a walk of what I'm going to refer to as justification the word justification is nothing more than a biblical term for salvation whenever you see the word justified or justification in the new testament or in the scriptures what god is revealing to you and to me is this is the first step this is the first stage those of you that went hiking with us to 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 baldy last year or a couple of years ago your life is in the car, you're driving, you're doing your own thing. And when you get to the parking lot, you get out of your car, you put on all your gear, and we got to the trailhead. Remember that from last year, Bobby Lee? We all got together and we took a picture. You know what? That's your, the beginning of your journey. You were in your separate cars doing your own thing. We all drove separately, but when we all came together, we all together prepared to make that jaunt, that journey together up to Baldy. Yeah, we dispersed at different times, kind of like we do in life. But nonetheless, coming together at the trailhead was stage one. You know how God brings us together spiritually in this life? By realizing who, who Jesus is and what he did for you and for me. In the letter to the Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, we know those verses because we, we went through them several times together in, in our study of Ephesians. But Paul wrote, for by grace, for by grace, for by grace, for by grace are you saved through faith. And not of yourselves, he says, it is what? It is a gift of God. Verse 9 says, lest any man should boast. See, man has a tendency of boasting and saying, I'm more holy or I'm more sanctified or I'm more spiritual by the things I do. We see that and hear that all the time in religion. No, God says the only way to really begin this journey is to embrace and understand what my son did for you. And it's called grace. It's through grace. It's through his death. It's through that gift that God offers you and me. The, the new birth and the new family and the new coming together begins. Remember these words from John as he was describing who Jesus Christ is in our life? In John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, 
John wrote these words, but as many as received him, speaking of Christ, but as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. You become part of God's family when you receive him, when you make him your personal savior, when you accept that free gift of grace, you're in. That's justification. This is stage one of the journey. And you know, you know what Jesus refers to us? Or he likens us to a newborn babe. John chapter number three, huh? You are now born again. Remember when you first brought little Mateo home, Darlene? He wasn't that little. He's always been Mateo. But when you bring him home, there's this period of time where you're having to do everything for him. And how do we know that he has a need? He begins to cry. He begins to wail. Kind of like some of us. John, would you come? I need to talk to you. I need to meet with you. I'm dealing with this. I'm dealing with that. You know what? And we do, and we commit to making sure that your needs are met, but we will commit to you. And we will do whatever we need to do to feed you. But the expectation is at least you take that step to grow. That's what the next step, the next stage is about, is growth. But as we consider these little guys, these little tykes and tykets, when they're growing up, and they're first learning to walk, how many times is they're just learning to stand and they're leaning on the couch or on the coffee table? Are they wobbling around and just trying to figure things out. And as good parents, you know what we'll do or what we should be doing? Encouraging that little one to take that step. And just when they're about to fall, remember those times? Just when that little baby is about to fall, what do we normally do? That's right, we catch them. Why? Because we love them. Because they're our little newborn, they're our little child. But how many churches... When that little newborn falls, are they kicked out the doors? Are they not allowed back into the church? They're churched or they're, what's the word that the, uh, the, the um, Amish use? They shun. We shun. And God says, you church, you have a responsibility to take care of these newborn babes that I've blessed you with that I've put in your midst. It's our responsibility to teach them how to walk. Because one of these days, little Mateo at 9, 10, 11, 12 months old, a year old, two years old, now he's taking steps. You wouldn't take a 9-month-old, 10-month-old, physically I'm talking about, up Santa Fe Baldy, would you? But that's what we do sometimes in church, don't we? All right, you're saved now. I want you to do all this, take care of all this, do all that, do all this. But those of you that have been walking around for a while and have grown, and I can really relate to this because there were 10 of us in my family. And I just happened to show up on the top end of the group. I have an older sister than me, than my brother Mark behind me. And you know what we had to do is we were 10, 11, 12 years old. We had the responsibility of changing the diapers of the newbies that showed up in our family. Guys like Steve. <laughs> I changed a lot of his diapers, man. And let me tell you, they were not good. <laughs> you know what, folks? That is a picture of God designing the church and the body of Christ and how we are to take care of each other and how the older believers or the older children are to take care of the younger ones as God leads them and puts them into our midst and into our lives. Why? So that we can get to stage two. And stage two is really what today is about. A walk of sanctification. I didn't show you the, for, where the first time Enoch shows up, did I? In, um, did I? I did not. Did I? Did I tell you the gospel of Luke? I don't think I did. I didn't, did I? Let's back up one stage. Go back to stage one. This is the first occurrence of Luke 
in the New Testament. Turn, not of Luke, of Enoch in the First Testament. This dedicated guy. Luke chapter number 3. Stage 1, a walk of justification. It says this, and what you find in Luke chapter 3 is this very profound, very significant um, very significant passage that deals with the, de- the genealogy of Jesus Christ from Luke's perspective. But what you do in this passage, which is different than Matthew's genealogy, you find an interesting phase that speaks of this whole relationship thing. Look what it says here in verse 37 of chapter 3. Which was the son of Methuselah. I'm just going to pick up there because there's an entire list. Jared is the guy listed in 36, but look at verse 37. Which was the son of Methuselah, which was the son of who? Enoch. Here Enoch shows up in your Bible in the New Testament for the first time. Who was the son of Jared, which was the son of Meliel, which was the son of Canaan, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam. And what was Adam? The son of what? The son of God. There's the relationship thing. You know what justification does? It brings you into God's family. It bring you, brings you into a place where you could be nurtured, where you could be taught to walk. Which leads us now into stage two and this wa- walk of sanctification. Now you're learning to take steps. That's all walking is, right? Walking is nothing more than taking steps, putting one foot in front of the other. And God desires that of each and every one of us is that we start taking steps in our lives. This is why we changed the name of our church last summer. is so that we don't just consider and stay at the base of the mountain justification, which was what the blood of Christ, Sangre de Cristo Bible Church, really speaks about. And I love that, that name that we embraced for several years. But now it's time for us to walk, to ascend, to make the climb. To allow your condition to match your position of who you are in Christ. And you find the principles of sanctification, of dedication in Hebrews chapter number 11, verses 5 and 6, which is the next occurrence of Enoch in the Word of God. Go ahead and turn there if you would like. I want you to see the text with me because it's so profound. It's so deep. Remember when you first came to Christ? We didn't really have a story to tell, did we? We had no testimony outside of the fact that every one of us were wretched sinners heading down this ugly path of life. And because of His grace and His death on the cross for you, now you are included in His family, but... Really, this is where the real journey begins, where the real story begins, where the real life begins. This is going to be the key to really understanding and embracing this whole issue of who you are in Christ and His glory and His name is your sanctified life. Look with me in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 5 and 6. It says, By faith Enoch, or dedicated, or sanctified, he was translated that he should not see death. Isn't that cool? Little reminder. Remember this guy? He didn't die. You know what's so awesome about your new birth? Your new birth speaks of who you are spiritually in Christ, and you will never die. It's called eternal life. For by, not for by grace. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have what? But have eternal life. But have everlasting life. When does that play out? How does that happen? The day that you received him. Your eternal life began the day that you made Jesus your personal savior. Your new birth began. Now you're an infant. You're a newborn babe. The charge and the challenge and the issue for you and for me is will you take those steps to grow? That's what sanctification is about. About growing. Becoming Christ-like. And it doesn't happen overnight. And I'm going to tell you this up front. It doesn't happen by osmosis. It doesn't happen just because you want it to happen. You have to 
be willing to dedicate your life to him. But I want you to know there's nothing sweeter, there's nothing more profound than dedicating and giving your life to Christ. Look with me in Hebrews 11, verses 5 and 6. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. I love this phrase. Do you ever stop and consider what the Bible says next? What the Holy Spirit says next to us? And the Bible says that he was what? And he was not found. You know what that tells me about this guy? That he, that his life had such an impact with those that he worked with, with those that he lived next to, with those that he went to church with, because I guarantee if the rapture happened tonight, and it just might, there would, be, there would still be church next week. People would still be holding church. But you know what I love about this phrase, and he was not found? That there were people that there were people looking for him. Where is this guy who lived this dedicated walk with God? People began to miss him, his co-workers, his employees. I read a story not that long ago about a guy that literally died at his cubicle. And until he started to decompose and stink and do whatever bodies, dead bodies do, nobody really cared or bothered. (laughs) They just walked past him every single day. Ask yourself, is your life mattering in the life of someone else? If the rapture was to happen tonight, would anybody be asking, where's Michael? Where's Kalani? And hopefully they're asking because of your testimony and your life and not because you're just performing some basic function in this life. Look at the rest of the passage. It says in verse number five, and he was not found because God had translated him for before his translation before God removed him off this planet, look what the word of God says, that he had this testimony. He had a life, in other words, that he did what? That he pleased God. You want to get to the most base, the most basic, dedicated, sanctified approach to your life? How about just starting there with those words? How about just living a life, although you may not know what it all means right now? How about just embracing and making this your heart prayer that you have a life or a testimony that simply pleases God? Just start start there. Is God pleased with my actions? Is God pleased with where my I at in my journey and my ascent this is who and what this guy represents now look down with me in verse number six but without faith but without faith but without faith you know what the key to growth is faith but without faith it is listen to these words it is absolutely i added the word absolutely but it is impossible to please him. You know why that is? Because without faith, you have no concept of who he is. You have no concept about the significance of these names and what he's really about and what your life in my life should be about, which is his glory. It says in verse six, for he that cometh to God For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. Do you really know who he is? This is why we've taken these last several weeks coming together just to understand and know these names so that we can grasp the attributes and 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 the character qualities of this great God that we serve. His goodness, his graciousness. And he's because he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And look what he says last. He says, and that he is a rewarder of them that do what? That diligently seek him. Seek him. 
everything that we do in this church as a church in discipling and in Bible study and life groups is all about equipping you with whatever it is that you need to diligently seek Him. Because as you diligently seek Him and desire to know Him and become more like Him, this is where the transformation occurs. This is where it happens. And this is where He's glorified in our lives. There's eight things I want to share with you real quick. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, I want to give you something very practical, eight things that I want us to consider. And I want you to listen closely to these eight things because these are practical things that we can start doing today, right after church, that are going to help you embrace and understand what it means to be sanctified. Practical, as real as we could get. What's interesting about the number eight, you know what the number eight represents in scripture? You Bible students, where's Sylvia Barella? She always has all the answers. What's the number eight represent? New beginnings. You want a new beginning in your life? Start with these eight things that we're about to lay out. Look with me in chapter five. First Thessalonians chapter five. I'm going to begin reading here in verse number, um, in, in verse number 15. It says this, see that none, speaking to you and to me, see that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. In other words, stop finding fault in everyone and anyone that God puts in your life and trying to bring about some vengeful action or reaction to somebody doing you wrong. Paul says, stop it. Forgive, he says. Jesus hanging on the cross, his very last words was, Father, forgive them, forgive John, for he know not what he does. The epitome of forgiveness. God begins this incredible list by challenging us and charging us to be forgiving. And look at the next one, number two, rejoice. Rejoice evermore. Praise him. Worship him. Sing songs to him. Number three. Here's a tough one. Here's a challenging one. Pray without ceasing. That means when you leave here, instead of looking down at your cell phone, make sure you look down and you're praying to God as you're driving down St. Francis. That's really what it means. No, it doesn't mean that. You know what you do? You do what Solomon said in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in him with all thy ways. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Constant acknowledgement, constant communion, constant communication with God. That's what it means to pray without ceasing. You're running everything by him because when you're, we're doing that, when we're doing we're thinking about him. We're thinking about his impact and his influence on our lives is what he means by praying without ceasing. And look at the next one. In everything, this is a tough one for Americans. In everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything. See, as Americans, we're good about giving thanks for everything. But in this verse, he's saying, in everything, give thanks. In your ugly circumstance, you praise him, you thank him. An attitude of gratitude Start there and watch how he begins to change how you think. You'll never be able to rejoice until you have a grateful heart. That breath you just, I just heard. How about thanking him for that? How about that heartbeat he just gave you right now? How about that roof over your head? Food in your stomach? How about thanking him for him? The Lord of sanctification. Look what he says next. Quench not the spirit. Don't douse what it is that he's doing in your life because of your crazy thought life, because of your crazy toxic thoughts. He says, quench not the spirit. Verse number 20. Here's one for this morning. Some of us sitting in the room right now saying, man, this guy's a knucklehead. And I know that. You don't have to tell me. But he says, despise not prophesying. (laughs) 
Verse 21, prove all things. Prove all things and hold fast. Grab on, keep and hang on to that which is, listen to this, which is what? Which is good. Abstain, he says. Stay away from all, not just some of the things, but all appearance of evil. Pretty practical, huh? Eight things. But here's what's awesome. Look at the next verse. Look what he says next to you and to me. And the very God of peace. Anybody here want some peace in their lives? Do these eight things. And the very God of peace will do what? Will do what? Sanctify you wholly. W-H-O-L-L-Y. Completely, your entire being. And the very God of peace will sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and your soul and your body, look at this one, be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We sang a couple songs this morning about the fact that he's coming back. He's returning in glory. You know what Paul says to us in this verse? Stay focused on him. Do these eight things. Apply these eight things. Leave the, live these eight things. And he'll sanctify you wholly and keep you blameless. In other words, there won't be any reason for people to find fault in your life until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, which brings us to the last point, a walk of glorification. In other words, we've arrived. This is the ultimate goal. But you know what's so unfortunate? We'll never really arrive. (laughs) That's somewhat unfortunate, huh? We'll never quite be like Jesus, but we can get close. You can get close through sanctification, through your walk, through this testimony that pleases God. Paul said to the Philippians in Philippians chapter 1 in verse 6, listen closely to these words. He says, being confident of this very thing, you Philippians, that he, God, that he who hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the what? Until the day of Jesus Christ. You know what the day of Jesus Christ is? The rapture, the translation, the leaving this planet. And what God is doing in each and every one of our lives, as in that process, he's chipping away. He's he's taking chunks of of stone, of marble, of whatever it is in our lives that is hindering our limit or limiting us from truly bringing glory to God in his life. And this is the last stage. And this is where you find the last occurrence of Enoch in the Bible. Look with me in the book of Jude. If you're not sure where Jude is, find Revelation. I'm sure all of you know where Revelation is. It's that little one chapter deep profound book that speaks of the falling away of man just before Jesus comes back. The craziness. And then it's, you know what you're getting from Jude? You're getting a replay of Genesis chapter 5 and 6. When Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And it says this, In Jude chapter 1 in verse number, listen closely, guess who shows up again? Verse number 14. And Enoch, also the seventh from Adam. The same guy, go back and read Luke chapter 3 and you'll see that he's the seventh guy from Adam. And Enoch, the dedicated one, also the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these saying he was also a prophet god revealed to him an incredible powerful truth and you know what that truth was or what that truth is look at the rest of the verse behold the lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints you're coming back with him in glory In Revelation chapter 19, after all the stuff that plays out on this crazy, during this crazy time known as the book of Revelation, 
where God brings Israel back with him. At the same time, he's creating, he's forming this army, which you and I are a part of. And we come back with him in Revelation chapter 19 and verse number 11. In glory. So you know what this journey, you know what this life, this walk, this sanctification becomes about? Preparing ourselves for that great day. That great day, that day when he gathers us all together and he establishes his kingdom and he makes right all the wrongs. He brings redemption to this creation. He brings redemption to this planet. And you know what else he does? He brings redemption through you and to your lives. Kalani, would you come up? Would you sing that Aaron?